Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father Divine, Mother, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Friend, Beloved God Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ Babaji Krishna, Babaji Krishna Lahiri, Mahashaya, Lahiri Mahashaya Swami Sri Yukteswar Beloved Master, Master Paramhansa Yogananda, Paramhansa Yogananda saints, of all religions, saints of all religions, humbly we bow to you all. We bow to you all. Help us to attune ourselves, Help us to, attune ourselves to your infinite presence within, to your infinite presence within that we may live in this world with calmness, with calmness courage, courage, and ever new joy. And ever new joy. We, are your children. we are your children. Guide us and bless us always. Guide us and bless us always. Om. Peace. Peace. Amen. Amen. This is just an informal gathering so that I can tell many people at the same time about the journey that I had. Some of you have already heard some of it. Um, but I'm very happy to keep talking about it for a very long time. So uh, I'll tell you the least interesting part first. <laughs> I, I was gone about a little more than two weeks or three weeks, almost three weeks, I guess. And I went first to Italy. Many of you know that I, I went to... Um, Israel three years ago on a pilgrimage and I I was very intense about going there and very eager and um, and after I had been there for that journey I sort of felt like I'd done it and so I was quite surprised uh, just a few weeks before I left I got a a, a, a a basic email from Assisi that warned, warned us that there was only one more place left in their pilgrimage. And it was just a bulk email, and something in my ear said that I was supposed to take that place. So I just was very surprised and accepted that I was supposed to. But it was also convenient because the book I've written about Swamiji is being designed by Tajindra, who works out of Assisi, and I knew it would be helpful if I could go and sit next to him. And also, I have three extremely close women friends in India, which in Assisi, which is Uma Shivani and Kirtani. And especially since Swami died, his Swami used to pull us all together because he would be somewhere and then everyone would come. But since his passing, that, that magnet of pulling people from all over the world to one spot hasn't happened in the same way. And I, I was missing them. And nothing that I tried to work out, especially to be with Kirtani, had worked at all. So I sort of felt like that was a large part of why I was going. And also Anand and Kirtani were going to Israel. So I went over to Assisi, and I also had, had not been inside Swami's house since um, a couple of days after he died. And when we went, to Assisi in 2013, or, you know, April 22nd, I think is when we went, when he passed. It was naturally a very intense period. He was still stretched out in an open coffin in the temple there. And it was so um, confusing not to see him. And I sort of was accepting it all, th all, th all those years ago until I got to his house, and then I realized subconsciously, I just expected when we finally got to his house, he would be there. So it was, it was very upsetting to me to get to his house all those years ago. And I haven't been back in it since. And even when we, um, is there a problem with this? Okay. When, uh, even when I got there, I didn't go to the house. I was there about four or five days, and I just didn't go. 
finally they scheduled a satsang in the house for me. And so I went over there that I was giving. And, <laughs> and uh, so I had to go. But also then, the next morning, I went to the house by myself, and uh, there was no one else around upstairs. Kirtani and Anand lived downstairs, but upstairs. And so I had the whole house to myself. And I, you know, I've, I've, I've stayed in that house as a guest, and I've been in that house and cooked in that house, and so it's sort of like my house. So I just went and I opened all the cabinets. I looked at everything in, the, in his bedroom. They have the closet and his meditation room blocked off, and I opened everything up and went inside. And, and that was also very, um, it's sort of like it was unfi really, it was seriously unfinished business. And that also was just extremely relieving. I also felt like I could carry back into that house because now I finished that book about Swami. So I really felt like I was carrying back into it, you know, look, we did it, sir. <laughs> and I felt very pleased with that. And deep in the closet, I found two different uh, picture books that this community had sent Swami for his birthday. I mean, there were uh, lots of picture books from lots of communities. They were, you know, piled up over the years, but from many years ago from here with notes and pictures. And so it was a whole really wonderful with all of you. It was very, it was very much about you. And I was telling a group the other morning when they built that house where Swami lives in Assisi, uh, David was one of the ones who went over to help build it. Swami just called up and insisted that he come, even though building is not his strong suit. <laughs> but, but when it came time to build Swami's meditation room, he had a printed uh, list of our members, and so he put it in the wall right behind where the pictures are. So when I sat in Swami's meditation room, I was conscious of the fact that that's, it's in the wall there. They, uh, anyway, so all that was really great. And then I sat with Tajindra, who's designing the book, for two full days, and we did a tremendous amount of work. So sort of like everything was rolling to completion. And, and they had me do, I think, three, yeah, three satsangs, I think it was. And over these last years of so much seclusion, I have developed a rather deep aversion to public speaking, I think is the only word I can use. <laughs> Especially outside of home, being away from home, being translated, you know, there's lots of things I didn't like. And I also felt like God had lured me over there to remind me that it was okay, that I can do that and it's all right. So it, it, you sort of, I, I just have lost touch with it. I'm still reluctant, but anyway. Um, so by the time we left, it, for a CC, and then we had a, I had a very long afternoon with the girlfriends and with Laura and Paolo, mm -hmm. Tassetto, Naria Tassetto and Nandini, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. But um, so by the time we left for Israel, I was feeling about as about as free as I have ever felt in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, pilgrimage is very subjective. Uh, when you travel with the group. People have different experiences in different places. You have all these expectations about what this is going to be for you, and then it's a, just a zip, and then you're just sitting having lunch someday, and the power of God descends on you. You just don't know when it's going to come. Fortunately, I've had experience, so I was at ease. But I was just really ready for this, and I was traveling with Kirtani and Anand and Narya especially, who were special of friends, Premi, the three of them plus Premi lead this trip. It was pretty half, half and half Italian speakers and half English speakers. They actually had Benedetta come on the trip just to translate from Italian to English. So we had these little ear things and whenever they were speaking Italian, we would hear English in our ear. So we managed all of that. When I went three years ago, in my mind, I kept saying that I was going to Jerusalem. I mean, I, when I would say I'm going to Jerusalem, I, as you all know, I've always had a very strong feeling about the life of Christ, and I've spent all these years with Christmases and Easter's since, since I, well, since I've been on the path. So the Bible is really vivid to me. The stories of the New Testament are vivid. And when I went all those years ago, the whole three years ago, it was all about Jerusalem. 
And I came, I went through India at that point, and then I missed two different planes in Rome. And I, I arrived a full day late for the pilgrimage, which was the, the first day in Jerusalem. Then there was some kind of random violence in the old city, so the tour group took us out. And so I ended up, in my mind, I think I had one day there. And it was, and we went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which I'll talk about in this context, on a day when there were about 800,000 people there. And it was just total chaos, and I couldn't understand anything about it. And I had wonderful experiences on that trip in many different places, but Jerusalem was just nothing, really virtually nothing. You know, And when I couldn't get to Jerusalem on that trip, and I was in Rome, I was... I was completely beside myself for like two and a half days. I just, I was frantic. And I, I just, but I couldn't get there. It was, the whole thing was very strange. So this time, you know, I just sailed in with all these people and they all knew what they were doing. And it was, and it, somehow as soon as I got to Israel, my whole consciousness went somewhere to a very pleasant place that I have rarely been. And I've certainly never been in it for such a long period of time. It's just somehow everything was perfect. It was what I was said earlier. It's like everything was free. And it was like time, I guess, for that experience. So this trip was only 10 days. The last one was longer. I went on the other one because it was longer. This was 10. So it was really uh, fun-filled and action-packed. You know, we just got on the bus early in the morning and we were on the bus until late at night and we went to all the main places and they we um, <coughs> Israel is not very big and so you can kind of tootle around on a bus all through it the last time I was there also I was intensely conscious of the political situation and was almost never able to separate myself from a feeling of um, well, actually, the word almost was despair, um, partly because of my Jewish heritage and my awareness of Israel and the violence that surrounds it. It just, it, and it was very disturbing to me almost continuously. This time, and subjective reality is so amazing, nothing had changed, absolutely nothing. But I thought, oh, the more terrible the world situation, the more people like us ought to just come in and give it good energy. So instead of feeling pulled down by it, I sort of felt this responsibility to be really free and spiritual. And I saw all the same things exactly and just read them differently, which you think, why don't we do this more often? <laughs> you know, like, why do I save this for this special experience? In fact, I really had a very strong feeling of, you know, people of light consciousness just need to walk through the earth radiating light consciousness. And it, it's like um, we have a really serious responsibility not to get involved in politics, which is kind of an opposite point of view. And I don't mean that we should never know what's going on or anything like that. Swamiji said, you know, we're interested in lots of things besides Kriya, so why not be interested in what's going on on the planet? But... Uh, it's more like we have a responsibility not to be pulled down by it because what else is going to help? So when we, um, let me just sort of try to pull myself back to where we started. So I'll just tell you, we, we went, we spent four days at the Sea of Galilee and four days in Jerusalem and then one day uh, in Jericho, which was to do the Jordan River and something else, two nights maybe just one night there. That's only nine, and there were ten nights, but something like that. So we mostly were just really settled. So Jesus' life is really in these really two extremely different realities. One is out in the Sea of Galilee, even now, is still not very developed. It's, it's very open and very country-like. And then even from there, you go farther out into the desert, and you, you go into these just barren wilderness places, then you go into Jerusalem, and you have the old city with all the bricks, and it's really crowded. And, and of course, every place that's related to Jesus has had all these 2,000 years so that every little tiny thing has some big edifice built around it. 
and there were hundreds and hundreds of people. And part of what you're doing is there's no other country in the world that you can travel in where everybody is there for the same reason. And it's a spiritual reason as people read it. And they're from all over the world. There's lots of evangelicals from Africa. There was, there was a few Indians, not a lot of Indian people, lots of Americans, lots of Italians and Spanish-speaking people because of all their devotion. Well, basically, lots of everybody was there. And a lot of the people from the groups from Mozambique, they, they all go out and they buy some colorful fabric and all the men and women make outfits. Mm -hmm. So you have all these crowds of people in, you know, purple flowers and turquoise stripes and everybody's doing their music at the top of their voice and, and they're doing their prayers and then they have their priests. And then in the churches you have the Roman Catholic and you have the Greek Orthodox who are very different from each other and who owns which one is how it looks. And, and then you have all those priests and nuns all walking around. And you sit there and you think, this was just one guy. You know, just like all that time ago, Jesus just came, did what he did, didn't live very long, then was taken off of the earth. And my gosh, look at the influence he had. It was also one of the things that made me realize why do we ever think about politics? <laughs> or why do we ever think about anything that's happening? Because you can see where, you know, just where the real, the real power comes from. And people's expression varies widely. And you can either be annoyed with it or you can be charmed by it. And be ch being charmed by it seemed definitely the wiser choice. Because there was just nothing you could do about how people interpret it. So we were out there at the Sea of Galilee and we, we went to, you know, what's, what's really left from Jesus's life is a lot of rock, rock and caves, because those are the things that last. So the whole, the whole trip got to be about rocks. <laughs> you have the Sea of Galilee and then on the shores of the Sea of Galilee is this place to, called uh, Tagba. And Tagba is where or Tabga. It's where Jesus, after he was crucified, appeared to the men when they were fishing. It's the story about they were fishing, they couldn't get any fish. He said, put the net on the right side. They do it like that. Then they realized it was Jesus talking to them. And then in the story, Jesus is on the beach and he's frying fish <laughs> on a rock there. And he's making them breakfast. And, and the, the point of the story is that he was really there. It wasn't a vision. He was just with them as much as he'd ever been with them. So there's a church, and inside the church, the church is built on this big rock. And this is the big rock where Jesus was frying fish. And there's the beach, and there's the Sea of Galilee right here. And it, it's... Uh, it's so vivid, that's all I can say. We, they, they had this wonderful thing, they meaning the, the leaders of this. When Master went to, to India in 1935, he went through Israel, and he went to the holy places, and he wrote letters back to Rajasi, because Rajasi had financed his trip. So in, in the places where, where Master had written about it, they, they, they read it. And Master's comment, which was the same as Swami's, is almost every place is authentic. You know, if they say this is the rock where he fried fish, this is the rock where he fried fish. Swami felt the only place that wasn't was the room, that the place they claim where the Last Supper took place. But, uh, but lots of the really key important places. So, you know, you're just, you're sitting, sometimes the rocks were under glass, <laughs> and sometimes the rocks are just there. So you, you, you sit down in this church and they're, they're relatively, most of them were relatively plain. They were not oppressive. You're just sitting there and there's this rock right in front of you and you get to, you know, what if I was the fisherman and what if I thought he had died and what if he was standing right there and making me breakfast right on this rock? Master said that wherever a, a, a self-realized master has lived, his presence is there forever. And so you just have to stop for a minute and 
feel it. And I, I, I went without having, you know, visions or actual memories. I, I, I shifted time zones. You know, I was just, I, somebody said, who do you think you were? And I said, nobody important. <laughs> you know, like I wasn't anybody significant. And I don't even know if I was there when Jesus was living, but I was close to it somewhere. So you get to just put everything aside and just be right there where the rock is. And right near there also is where he gave the Sermon on the Mount. So you, you sort of, and we had um, Duty with us, who is a beautiful singer and uh, the American woman Duty. She's a beautiful singer. She knows all the songs. She carries her guitar. She's totally uninhibited. Mm -hmm. And because she sings so beautifully, she knows that she can burst into song anywhere and people will just be extremely pleased. You know, <laughs> others of us who are uninhibited <laughs> are not so pleasing, but she's extremely pleasing. And, and the other thing that happened to me on this trip was because we have been doing for, I don't know, maybe as long as 20 years here, every Easter we do that whole oratorio sing-along. And so I have consistently sung every single one of the oratorio songs, including the solos, which if you're in the choir, you just never do that. So I knew all the words. I knew every song that belonged to every place. And... Uh, in, in writing this book about Swami, when I was writing about the oratorio, and Swami writing the oratorio, which was in 1985 and 86, somewhere in that, in that time. Um, no, excuse me, I think it was just before that, but it's right in that era. Uh, he, probably 83, just to be accurate, 83 and 84, he... Um, in, in writing the book, I was trying to explain what the effect of the oratorio was on Ananda. I'll just give you a silly anecdote from my own life to give you the picture. My parents had a, you know, they, they paid attention to Ananda. They got the mailings and so on. And we're from, we were a Jewish family. And when the oratorio was written, my mother it perceived that we had suddenly become Christians. And we, she became suddenly quite distressed because we had suddenly become Christians. And uh, I tried to explain to her we'd been Christians all along. <laughs> but she'd never picked up on it. But in actual fact, when I reflected on it, when he wrote the oratorio, we did become Christians. Because prior to that, we didn't have a self-realization way of relating to Jesus. And, and through that music, Swamiji created a vibration for Jesus that made him accessible and consistent with us. And it was, it was the words and the melodies, but it was, a, it was really a lot the melodies. Because that was what, when he wrote the oratorio, he tuned into each place and the melodies were given to him. And then he put words to them. The recitatives he wrote, the, the, which are the solos, all those little solos, he wrote the words first, because he had to. But what was happening is every place we went, because Duty knew all this music and because I also knew it, what it was, and they'd printed it up in a book, but because not everything is in Italian, they hadn't been as, as thorough with it as, as Duty and I were because we were English speaking. But she would sing, or, or, or Anand and she and others, where we would all sing together. And when you're in the spot where the, the song came from and then that, that melody goes through you, it, you, on so many levels, you appreciate uh, what Swami has done for us and what these gurus actually mean to our lives. So I was able to sort of feel and know those things. And the, 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 the piece that I understand from having had to work with this for so long is how the, the life of Christ relates to self-realization. You know, that, that you can be very devoted to Christ and read the Bible and, and love Him and all of that, but you don't, even we can. But there's this extra step of how it parallels our lives and how, how, it, how we understand it from our point of view. So I was always running that, and I was always articulating it because Ishani and Aryavan, Brian and Rachel, were on this trip also. And Ishani 
I grew up in a totally Jewish world, and she really knew nothing about Jesus. Nothing. More nothing than almost anyone I've met. <laughs> because she just was always in an, a Jewish atmosphere, and it was just never part of her reality. So, you know, every place we went, she would like, what's going on here? <laughs> So I was always having to explain it, wanting to explain it to them, which also kept it very fresh in my own mind, you know. And living, that's how it's always been. Like when Jesus appears on the beach to Peter, to my mind it's, what if I were Peter? What would that look like? Why was he frying fish? I mean, it seems so crazy, but he was wanting them to know that he was completely there. You know, if he just floated around... Lo, here I am returneth among you, but he's, you know, handing up a plate with a piece of bread and a fried fish on it. <laughs> I was remembering in Autobiography of a Yogi, the way Master describes the resurrection of Sri Yukteswar, you know, all these pieces go together. And he, remember he talks about how he puts his hand on his feet, and there was the characteristic feeling of his toes through his familiar canvas shoes. And he was really, Master was taking the most mundane image he could to tell you that Sri Yukteswar was really there. Even though, as Sri Yukteswar says, I see this as a light body, I just recreated this so you would recognize it, but you see it as the physical body that I was in. Because Jesus uh, was around for 40 days. He appeared periodically for 40 days after he was crucified. So it was a it was not a just a a one time in and out sort of thing. He was he was around. Yeah, not just one fish. So we were there and then I I can't quite, you know, I can't quite picture every piece of it. So let me think what else. The other thing that's really incredible right by the Sea of Galilee was um the, what's called the Mount of Transfiguration, Mount Tabor which is also way out there. And, you know, Jesus' life, he appears, he takes all his disciples out there, and there's this huge question as to who he is, because the Jewish tradition is filled with predictions that this Messiah is going to come. The Old Testament ends with the prediction of the Messiah. The Jews are politically oppressed. Their concept of the Messiah is that he's going to have worldly power and he's going to liberate them. So Jesus starts, you know, coming and making all these waves, but there's tremendous uh, uh, conversation among his disciples as to what it means. So, so not quite at the end of his life, but toward the end, he took um, John and Peter up to the top of this mountain, and it was there that there was this tremendous vision and Jesus is standing in the middle, and Moses is on one side, and Elijah is on the other. And Elijah is the last prophet of the Old Testament who predicts the coming of Jesus. And Moses, of course, is the prophet of Judaism. So John and Peter, seeing, seeing him in light, realize that he's the Christ. And this is Jesus transfigured, that his, that his um, would know that he was the Christ. It's this huge thing, and it's just goofy translations of the Bible. Premi's reading in the Italian version of the Bible, and uh, Benedetta's reading the English, and it says that this vision appears, and then Peter and John were overcome with sleep, and so they fall asleep like this, <laughs> you know, and then they wake up, and uh, afterwards I said, oh, really? They, they fell asleep, you know? My translation of the Bible says that they were overwhelmed with what they saw and they fell to the ground. Their translation says they fell asleep. It's like <laughs> they've gone all the way to the top of the mountain and they see Jesus in light and then they just say, oh, I'm really, you know, it's like <laughs> there's no coffee around here. I'm just going to take a snooze. <laughs> I mean, it is true that they fell asleep when Jesus was staying up all night before the crucifixion. But this one was too weird. It was the King James Version, but I, don't, I just don't accept it. <laughs> I take this as other one. But last time I went to Israel, and this time, that, was, that is the place. I, I don't know what it's about or what's going on up there at all. 
There's a beautiful church there, a beautiful Italian church. Seems to me like there's a rock, but I can't really re clearly remember the rock. <laughs> but uh, something happens up there, and, and you, you just, you're just gone. The last time, it, this is just, the last time I was there, it was exceedingly impersonal. And that was, the whole trip was like, I never, I never was really relating to Christ the first time. I was just relating to expansive consciousness. This time, everywhere I was, it was really, it was personal. In, in the sense of a con my consciousness of Jesus and my consciousness of myself in relation to him. But meditating up there, when the sermon I gave yesterday was a lot from that experience of just going into a place where you finally aren't there, where you finally can see the difference between what you normally think of yourself and who you actually are. And, and you, you can just see, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could just erase the self, just erase it. And you kind of get a little closer to it. So every place I went, I know how, I really know how to be a pilgrim. I'm really good at being a pilgrim because I was a pilgrim leader for a long time. So I know what it is to be a good pilgrim. And I had no responsibility. So every place I go, I just find a corner. I mean, I just ferret around, find a place where I could sit really comfortably and I just sit. I just went there and I just sat for a very long time. And, you know, there's a mask going on around you. There's people walking in, all kinds of stuff. And periodically, our group would sing. You know, we just burst into song. And then somebody else would burst into song. With all due respect, our music is better. <laughs> and as a rule, our singers are better, too. But nonetheless, everybody sings with devotion. And it was, it was just really amazing. You, you know, in, in, in moments like that, you, you wonder, like, what am I doing with the rest of my life? But I also know f enough from experience that those things drop on you, and then they're taken away. And if you, if you spend even a moment trying to hold on to it, it just, it's given to you, and then it's gone. But it was, I could spend a long time up there. Um, so that, and then you go to where um, Peter lived, Capernaum, it's all near there. These are just little villages. By now everything is, you know, rubble, and, but it's, it's really glorious. We also went to the place where the Annunciation happened, where Mary was living when the angel came to her. And that was, uh, that was also, that was a beautiful church with and you sort of go down and sort of the house, a lot of the houses were sort of caves or half caves, but uh, also just beautiful. Um, so the place of Annunciation, I, I, I sort of just want to mention the most important one, so let me think where else, what else there was out there. We also went way, oh, I know where we went. Then we went way out in the desert. And you know, I mean, desert is really desert out there. We went to the Mount of Temptation, which, uh, which I did not visit before. And you just drive to the middle of nowhere, and then you park the bus, and then you walk up the mount, which is all these staircases up to the top. And there's this old Greek Orthodox uh, monastery, which is like built on the side of this hill, hundreds of feet in the air. I don't know if there's, I don't think you can drive. I think you have to just walk up. And it's very narrow and it's like the mountain is on one side and there's kind of caves on this side and these little tiny rooms hanging here. And you, you just walk up these stairs and you walk through these long narrow corridors and you finally get to the point where there's the rock. And it's sort of, there's the rock on which Satan offered to have Jesus throw himself down and you can look out the window and you know, it was a long way down. And it's just, you're standing there. It's so uh, uh, vivid. And, ha and in that same monastery, there's a, a very big cave with, that leads to two smaller caves. So you, you kind of get way back and you have a mountain over your head and a, a cliff on this side. And even the monastery is a tiny imposition on the place. And it's just what you, you, you ask yourself, you know, what would I do if? And you think about all the things, 
all the ways that the world is tempting you. And in that, in that case, they asked me to speak there, and I was talking about uh, Swami's interpretation of Judas, how Judas um, believed that Jesus was the Christ, but believed that, that Jesus' marketing techniques were very poor, and that Jesus really needed to cultivate the people in power, and that he needed to get the powerful people on his side, and he needed to use their power to his advantage. So the way Swami and Master's interpretation is that when Judas you know, helped Jesus to be arrested, he was trying to force Jesus to declare himself, thinking that Jesus would then put forward his power, and his power would be greater than the worldly power, and then the whole project would really get off the ground, instead of this just sort of going hither and thither with all these ne'er-do-wells, which is more or less how he saw it. But in fact, Jesus allowed himself to be taken, and crucified, and die, and that's why Jesus hung himself immediately. Beca Judas. Judas, because, yes, I, I tend to say that wrong, because it had all gone so horribly wrong, which is a much more sensible explanation because Judas was a very highly evolved soul, and he did know what he had, but he allowed his ego to blind him to the truth of what was happening. So I was talking about that's what Jesus, that's what the devil was saying to Jesus. He was saying, who is really in charge of the world? You know, look, I have all this power. And Swami's song about the temptation of Jesus, where Jesus says, the devil says, the song begins with the devil, and you don't actually know that it's the devil, except the bass always has the, the villain's part. <laughs> and, but he says, you know, it, I, I, you can have dominion over the whole world. All you have to do is take back a little of what you've given. You know, just make yourself a little more powerful, and I can put you in charge of all of this. And, I mean, that's, it, it's what we're all facing all the time. Where does power really come from? Does, does, you know, do we really know how to make communities? Do we really know how to make schools? Do we really know how to live our lives? Or do we have to try to please this world out here, would we be more popular if we were just a little more like them? If we put a little bass behind some of Swami's songs, you know, wouldn't that just make them like a little more acceptable and everybody would like it? If we just downplayed discipleship just a little bit, you know, just, I mean, those are the thoughts. Where does power really come from? And that's what Jesus was, uh, Satan was demonstrating. So you're up there looking, standing on that rock, and where you're looking at it because you can't stand on it, but you're standing in front of it. And you're thinking, like, you know, do, how much faith do I have to really repudiate that illusion when it seems so strong? And because of the, all the politics that are going on in the world and all the anxiousness that a person can feel about all, where, where does power really come from? So that was, that was magnificent. It was just magnificent, sitting in that cage, cage cave, you know, with all that, um, it, and also just the contrast between those d that desert solitude and then Jesus having to walk back into Jerusalem where, you know, this was all about God and this was all about the world. And he would go out into those desert places and he kept his disciples out in those very simple places, but then he just had to have this, con this final confrontation which was so intense. And that we went out to, where, to Qumran, which was uh, an Essene community, also out in the desert, the same, you know, the same feeling. The, and then, and then we, went back to, we went to Jerusalem, not back to, but we went to there. And, uh, you know, I was really in Jerusalem this time. This was, this was what I had been expecting before. We stayed in a hotel which actually was a YMCA. Like in 1935, some millionaire devotee of the YMCA wanted to have a YMCA in Jerusalem and built this extraordinary building, which is still standing and is now a hotel. There was the same man who designed the Empire State Building designed this building. So it's this, but it's, it's an old, it's very interesting. It was a fun place to stay. And it's right within walking distance of the old city. 
But what happens in Jerusalem is that, that you are not alone. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other people there. And so this group was very smart. We, we wanted to do, we wanted to walk what the, the, the Via Della Rosa, which is where Jesus was, uh, you know, get, handed the cross and had to walk up there. But before that, no, we did that first, so I'll just tell it to you in sequence. I found out later that it was it was St. Francis who developed what the Catholics call the Stations of the Cross. He, and he also developed the um, nativity scene, the live nativity scenes. Although, interestingly, Kirtani just announced, but when St. Francis did the nativity scene, he didn't carry a baby, he carried light in his arms. I didn't ask Kirtani, how do you know this? But she just... <laughs> She just declared it as a fact, and I thought that was fascinating. Um, anyway, but we all carry a baby, so you know that that sent our whole Christmas Eve into like question mark for a while. <laughs> my actual thought, my actual thought after wow, that's interesting was, well, I just bought a new baby and I spent four hundred dollars for it, you know, <laughs> and we're going to use it at least one year. I promise you. Some of you don't know that our, the baby Jesus last year laid down his sweet head, which is, I, I set him on the ground and his head rolled off of his body. It was two days before Christmas. We glued it back on, but I don't have any faith that it will stay there, so we bought a new one. Um, anyway, so the St. Francis version of the Stations of the Cross are like these 12 or 14 different things that happened and, and when we bought our church, the Stations of the Cross were around there, pictures, and you, you go and you say different prayers. The St. Francis version is actually very up. It's like, you know, you see that Jesus stumbled, and so you, you say a prayer for perseverance in the face of obstacles. You see that Veronica comes and wipes his face, and so you, you say a prayer to have compassion and mercy. It's not like, oh, how he suffered, oh, how he suffered, oh, how he suffered. It's, oh, how brave and magnificent he was. So they know that if you wait until a decent hour in the day, they, meaning the people who organize this trip, there are hundreds of people. And you're walking through these narrow streets of the city of Jerusalem. So we went out at five in the morning. And we had it almost to ourselves. A group of early rising evangelicals got behind us. <laughs> But that all worked out well. So we went, not to every place, but almost every place. We had songs. And because the evangelicals were pushing us from behind, we started walking and singing, which actually was just fabulous. And Duty is so, her body's not that strong, but her will is like iron. And she just, you know, she just picked up that guitar and we just went along behind her. And, and it was it was real, you know. And you're... It, it, now it's all developed, but still you can, you know, it's very, it's uphill and it's a long winding uphill. And there's a place, and I don't, I, I don't exactly know how this, how this took place. Oh, I, Jesus must have fallen. That was probably it. He fell and he put his hand down because there's a stone that they say is a handprint on the wall. And s some people in our group, the high point of the whole pilgrimage was when they put their hand in the wall. I had very little expectation. I just put my hand on the wall, but others just talked about this electric current, and you just don't know. So you finally get through this whole thing, and it ends at what they call the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And the Holy Sepulchre, if you're Ishani, am I explaining this to you, is where Jesus' body was placed. The rock was rolled in front of it. Then on Easter morning they came, and the rock was rolled back, and the tomb was empty. So it's quite a place. And so there's now a big church built over it. And there's, the, there's and even when you get in the church, you still have to go up two uh, these really steep stairs. I think they made the stairs really steep to make it hard. The stairwell's about as long as this one, but they're big steps and it's really steep. So it's, and that's to get up to the point where Jesus was actually crucified. Mm -hmm. So you finally get up to this point and, and I think it must be a table for the mass, but everything is like hard to deal with. So there's a table and you kind of have to crawl under it. You know, you stand in this line and you crawl under it and and under glass in front of you is this huge rock 
and under the table there's a hole like that. You put your hand down and that's right where the cross was, just right in that spot. And, and when you actually put your hand there, you feel around and there's like a box, a rock box. And that's just, so you're on your knees right there like this. And you realize that if you, if you were there, you just, you know, you were, you were at the feet of the God. It was, it was very emotional for me. I was just, I, I didn't have any control over my feelings. It was, it was really something. And then there's lots of places where you can just slip off to the side and sit down. And then they're doing mass over here, and you know, there's people over here, and people are trying to get up those stairs. You have all these, lots of Americans who tend not to be older Americans who are not very strong. I mean, literally, you know, the, the guide is hauling these people up the stairs, and you think they're going to have a heart attack at the base of the cross, you know. And, but they're determined. Everybody's there for the same reason. So right below that, and this is all in a space, you know, bigger than this house, but not really that huge. Right over here, on, back on the ground level, there's an, a big slab of stone, which is about the size, a little smaller than a single bed. And the tradition is when they were, when they were able to take Jesus' body off the cross, they laid it down on this slab, they covered him with oil quickly because it was the Sabbath and they wrapped him in cloth. And so that's the slab that's right there. And you, you, you can lay yourself across it and it, 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 it always has a fragrance. People presumably are putting things there. It's a little oily and it's fragrant. And, and then, then you go another 10 paces and there's a small, very small chapel which is built over the cave where he was put. And it's very small. That, that was very surprising how small that was. Like, there's two rooms inside that chapel. And one of them is, um, it's one of them is like the size, uh, the only way I can say, it's like the size of a large bathroom. And then, right, and then there's a smaller room the size of a large closet. And in the outer room, there's a big piece of rock, which was the rock that was over it. And then you go into this tiny room, and the tiny room is about, there's a thing about as long as that couch, and it looks just like the paintings, mm -hmm. you know, of, of that Holy Sepulchre, but it's much smaller than you think. And hundreds of people line up to get into it, and they do mass in front of it, and they lock it all the time. It's, they do mass in front of it, and then they put the host inside and bring it out. So it's not that easy to get in because of the big crowds. I just wandered over there and they were just closing it for some reason to clean it actually they were closing it and I just slipped around the barricade I wasn't even really thinking I just slipped around the barricade and I just slipped in with this group and because it was sort of the last group I got to stay in there much longer because they move you much longer meaning five minutes but I uh, I couldn't believe it you know you, you are right where Jesus was lying and then right where he was resurrected. You're just right there. And it's uh, overwhelming is actually the only word I can think of. Later I figured out that, because it's just this little structure, that if you even can't get in, we just went and sat with our backs against this part of it, and there's even a little ledge. So you, can, you just put your back up against it, and you're as close as you are when you're inside. But it was... Uh, and then we were in Jerusalem for four nights and we all figured out. So every morning I woke up at 4 or 4.30 and just went, I wasn't the only one, and we just would beetle down there so that there weren't so many people around. Um, many people still couldn't get inside just because they didn't want to stand in line for so long or anything like that. But Arjavan, Ishani, and Benedetta, Narya knows everything. Just He's one of those people who knows everything, and he has this incredible good karma for being invited into places. He had an experience there. He was meditating in this other part of the church with this man named Ivan, and they, and they sort of challenged Jesus, or they prayed to Jesus, Jesus, we really want to get inside the Holy Sepulcher. So they come upstairs, and there's, you know, 100 or 300 people in line, and the guard just says to them, would you like to go in? <laughs> 
and he just, you know, kind of pushes people back and just sends them right in. Yeah, just like, yeah, I think because Narya is so gracious and generous in his nature, the whole world is generous back to him. But uh, he, Narya knew that on Saturday nights, after it's closed, which is about seven, alternately Roman Catholics and Greek Orthodox can go in. They take turns. He thought you could just go in. Turns out it's a little more different than that. You have, you, like, you have to make some arrangements, and you have to prove to them that you're either Roman Catholic or Greek Orthodox. <laughs> Naria assured, mu assured me that if it was Greek Orthodox, we were sunk. We couldn't, you know, we couldn't get in at all. Whatever happened, Aryavan, Benedetta, and Ishani were there when it was closing. Everyone else had left. And somehow or another, they got involved with this Ecuadorian evangelical Catholic, Catholic group, because it was a Roman Catholic night. And they sort of got kind of like part of that group. And then the guard, whoever, the priest, starts quizzing Benedetta, who is actually Catholic. So she came across really well. Then they asked, they asked Aryavan, Brian McSweeney, and he was able to say honestly that he went to high school at St. Francis. And so he was, he was able to say honestly that he, he started going to Mass when he was 14. <laughs> and Ishani apparently was invisible and they never spoke to her. <laughs> so at 7 o'clock, all the, the guards, you know, in this big, you know, very rajasic way, just push everybody out of the church, close the doors, bolt them, put ladders up against it, and they said, you can stay in, but you have to stay for four hours. So from 7 to 11, and she said once it was closed, she said there were about 30 people in the whole church, and they were there for four hours. And, and the last hour, they just photographed and filmed, and nobody stopped them, because they had all their equipment with them. Yeah, amazing. So we, we were having our closing circle. Benedetta was supposed to be there to translate. There was a little bit of crabbing about you know, irresponsible young people kind of energy. <laughs> but the next morning, everybody said, oh, did you make the right choice? You know, so they were able to just spend as much time as they wanted everywhere. Karma's very whatever it is. Also in that, also in that same church, St. Helena, 300 years after Jesus died, prayed to Jesus to be able to find the cross on which he was executed. And she came there, and she did. I mean, it's believed that she did. And then that cross now has been in, put into a million pieces, and it's done many miracles. So also sort of lower in the church, there's two beautiful chapels dedicated to St. Helena. And, you know, it's just every place you go is in that building. Uh, it's, Swamiji said, meditating at the base of that cross was the most transcendent spirit experience he has ever had at the time that he was there in 83 or 84. He said, and what he also said was, the experience that Jesus had was one of absolute joy and triumph. He said, the, the, the interpretation of Jesus' suffering on the cross is absolutely wrong. That's just, it's just like, it couldn't be, it couldn't be more untrue. So then now I was more caught up in the drama of it a lot. Actually, I had multiple experiences because I went every day. But that place, when I, I said to some of you, I'm, I'm actually okay now, but I came home on Monday, and really up until, pretty much up until last night, every time I would go to sleep, I was back in that church. I mean, just you know how you are when you sleep, you sort of lose your... And I would just, I just thought I was still in Jerusalem because it was just more real to me than anything else. And it, if Master was in fact Jesus, as Swami um, believes he was, then his life is very much a part of ours. And it even crossed my mind this morning that I think my relationship to Master is more through Jesus. And I, I can't really put that together in my mind, but it's, it's like Jesus' life is so vivid to me that it, it feels more like my portal. I can't think how the two realities come together and I don't need to know, or else it was unfinished business or something like that. I, I, can't, I can't really say what it was. Then the, um, I think the last, the, the 
Church of the Holy Sepulchre was by far the, and the, well, I'm going to say, and the Mount of Temptation and the Mount of Transfiguration. <laughs> but then we also went to the Church of the Nativity where Jesus was born. And Master also, oh, there's two pieces, two more pieces. Master also wrote about the Church of Nativity as being absolutely authentic. And uh, it's, in, uh, it's in Palestine, it's not in Israel. So the last time we went, our is it's illegal for Israelis to go into Palestine because if they get kidnapped or injured, then it puts the whole country of Israel in a difficult position. So last time we were there, we had an American Israeli, uh, an immigrant from America as a guide, and he basically got off the bus and a Palestinian travel guide got on and took us there and then the other. This woman has uh, we had a woman guide and she's Italian and she has an Italian passport so she goes back and forth we didn't actually have to show them but you might have to so she stayed with us and uh, it's, a, it's a relatively big church and the place where Jesus was actually born is again it's a cave and it's down sort of under and they, they did a Disneyland thing like this there were about 500 people there I think 500 was the right number. We stood in line for two hours. And you're not allowed to sing. We started singing. I thought, well, this will be fun. So we sang for a while, but then they came over and told us, no singing, no singing. But you can just talk. So everybody just talks for two hours. Fortunately, you know, we're a nice group, and we just did it. And it's not really awful. You're just kind of doing it. You finally get to this place where you crowd down in these stairs and go through this small door. It was actually... I, I, I freaked out a little. It was a little too much being herded into the galley of a ship and chained to the oar or something like that. Anyway, so you, you, have, you finally go down in this, and then there's a, a very small uh, cave, which is where Jesus was born, and Master verified all this. And again, you kind of crawl under, and you get to touch this spot, and then there's this place over here where the manger is, all very small. But over there is a rather large room, I mean, the, the rest of the cave is this huge space. And most people just file in like this and take a picture. That's what they all do. They all just file in and take a picture. So we went over here and meditated. And as soon as we started meditating, it was so blissful. Just, you know, there was so much just joy. And we sat there for half an hour while these people just went past us. And I heard an American voice say to uh, or not the, our guide, are they doing yoga? <laughs> and she said, well, sort of, they're meditating. And then later, when we, w we were sitting outside, and we just started, we sang for a long time, and I was just sitting there meditating before we started singing. I heard another American voice say, why were they meditating in there? And you think, oh, God. <laughs> why would we not be meditating in there? Also there, Narya's karma was amazing. We're all standing in line for two hours. At some point, Narya and Anand go out just to use the bathroom. They come back a half an hour later with all these photographs of the nativity place with nobody in it. They, and they were outside, and there's a back door. <laughs> the guard says to Narya, he didn't even ask, would you like to go in? <laughs> he says, sure. And for... God knows why, even though we were all crowded outside, he said there was nobody in there. So he and Anand just spent a little time, took lots of pictures, thanked the guard, went out the back door. However, it was really interesting. After we meditated and came back upstairs, we absolutely forgot that we'd been standing in line. I mean, it wasn't even like you thought it was worth it. It was like it was erased. It never happened. And later we sort of said to each other, oh yeah, remember we spent all morning just standing here waiting to get in. Gone. Completely gone. You, just don't, you don't even know where the power is coming from. But it just, you know, it comes up. We also, there was the, one, the other part that was really beautiful. We went to the Jordan River to be baptized in the Jordan. And uh, the whole, there's this whole long sort of pavilion thing. And people either put on bathing suits or they go in in their clothes or you can buy these white baptismal things and you know they're just everybody's coming in to be baptized in the Jordan and there's a deep place over here and a deep place over here and then kind of a shallow 
um, when I was here before, we all did a full immersion. This one, they just we sort of just waded in up to our ankles, and then we, they, we were blessed by the light bearers. But over here and over here, they're doing full immersion. Over here, it's African. And they're singing and saying hallelujah and praise the Lord. And every time anybody goes under, there's a big roar, you know, and everybody's fantastic. Over here is a huge group of Americans. Pastor Bob, you know, <laughs> Deacon Bill. <laughs> they're, they're up to their chests in water. And then there are 50 people who are all going down to be baptized in the Jordan River. And they all said a few words to their friends and family before they went under. And Americans are unique. <laughs> and American Christians, I mean, you had to love them. You couldn't not love them. It was so sincere. And then, you know, he would go down and they would all hoot and cheer. And you could feel it's like they were trying to feel it. And the, the, that's how they understood how to feel it. They didn't. If they stopped being rajasic, they wouldn't become sattvic. They would become tamasic, and they wouldn't be having any experience at all. So they just had to keep the energy up, and that was how they understood how to keep the energy up. And, you know, at least they were cheering about God and the Holy Jordan River. You know, it was... It was so you, you had to just decide that it was wonderful. Because if you didn't think it was wonderful, you would have lots of other points of view. We, we also, when we went to the little, this little chapel for where the shepherds were, there was a, a, a group of, of real, of, uh, real fundamentalist people in there and their preacher. And uh, they were singing hallelujah something or another. And, and we, it was once again, I'm just going to enjoy this. So we all kind of went back and we just started clapping with them, you know, and going with them. And then they paused for a second. Then they started the amen, you know, amen. Turns out later, duty started that song. <laughs> so we all did that one really good. And then their preacher got wound up and he spent a couple of minutes giving us the holy word. One of his people really felt the spirit and started trembling and shaking like this. And it was, it was a show. <laughs> then duty started singing something really beautiful and you know, we sang really beautifully for them, but it was, you know, it was like we would never have met and we would never have connected anywhere else in the world except right there. <laughs> and each of us in our own way was doing our best to uh, be part of Jesus' life. But, you know, I mean, I'm going to go back for a minute. Swami has often said that Master's influence on the planet would be like that that there would come a time when self-realization would define this, d define the whole global society. I mean, it's really, when, you, when you, you're there, you think 2,000 years is a long time, but it isn't. You just see how the influence of Jesus has just completely defined this reality. And of course, we're going, we're ascending. So as self-realization begins to come into it, you can, you can just see what might happen. You can also see how incredibly individualized and original all of all of it is i anyway that part of it was very superficial compared to you know what i really really felt deep in my soul but it was also part of it you know, you just get this really long view of the soul's long journey you know we say that every week the soul's long journey away from its home in God, and these are the stages of the soul's return, and you're just standing there, and every place you go, you're just seeing all these people doing their best. And it, it really, it's, it makes you cry, just repeatedly. The, just the, the purity and the magnificence and the, the originality and chaos of it. <laughs> I had, uh, also when I was there, I had... Uh, we had, there were two people from India on our trip. One, one woman is a devotee from the Mumbai or the Pune Center, and the other man is a, uh, he has an Italian wife, and he's, but both of them were raised Hindu. She's much more practicing. He's become more cosmopolitan, but he had a traditional Hindu upbringing. Jesus was a complete, this whole thing was a complete new experience for them. And I had the strong thought, oh, we should bring a group 
from India to the Holy Land. And interestingly, I called Daya, or I, was, I emailed with Daya and I mentioned it to her. She said, funny, I just a couple of days ago, I think actually the same day I did, she said, I had exactly the same thought. And I thought if we could really get even just a core group of people from India to really understand how Jesus fits into our work, it could really help bring the whole thing together. So I'm thinking of doing that. And I, I'm also thinking of maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe taking an American trip and then taking an India trip. This has been, this has been lurking back there for a long time. And when I was there, I thought, you know, this is something I really could do because I, I know this. I know this story. Shanti actually wanted, has wanted me to do this for years, but I wouldn't. So anyway, we're, we're in negotiation right now, thinking about it, <laughs> trying to think about whether we could go when it's colder so there would be fewer people. January and February are colder months in Jerusalem, but the number of visitors is fractional compared to the other seasons. So we're working, we're working on it. We'll have to see what's possible. We'll have to close our school so the teachers can go. Assisi, Assisi did a, a July trip one year just so the teachers could go. And she, uh, Kirtani said, it was hot, <laughs> but you know, but it wasn't unbearable. So we'll see. Anyway, that's in the works. And the other, just completely unrelated, is I, I talked to the Italian publishers and they're going to start translating the book I've written into Italian right away, so we'll get that fairly soon. And that's, I think that's the whole story. Is there any questions or thoughts or comments or anything? I feel I, a privilege doesn't begin to describe it. You know, it's just really, it was a, it was a gift from God that I will cherish forever. I said to Karen, if I looked in the mirror and saw a different face, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, I just, I could have a whole different head after this. <laughs> but you know, it begins to fade and all those things that you thought on the Mount of Transfiguration were never going to come back. Just one by one, they start coming back. It's the soul's long journey. Om Guru. Thank you for letting me say it all again. For, uh, for a split second, I was beginning to lose it. Yeah. All right. You all went with me everywhere. All I could think of, really, all I could think of was, oh, I've, I mean, I've got to bring the Palo Alto family yeah. here. <laughs> you know, these are my brothers and sisters. I can't, just, I can't just be doing this and not have them here. So at least you were in my spirit, but I kept thinking of, of busloads of us. We'll see what God wants. Okay. Thank you for coming over. Thank you.